with not only Sharik and the Center for American Muslim Philanthropy, but also the Lake Institute for Faith and Giving here at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And I'm going to turn it over briefly to David to say a word or two if he'd like. And then back to Sharik and our panelists. David. Well, I've already taken note that this is worth the price of admission. I know that it didn't cost us, that cost you much, but the fact we had an overview of sort of the, the, the lineage and history of, of Muslim philanthropy and these interconnections uh, was already uh, something that I think sets a, a wonderful story for us as we think about uh, hearing from interactions from, from those of you who are, are thinking about this work from, from within these kind of conversations. So uh, Lake Institute is just is privileged to be a part of the School of Philanthropy uh, and and to really help foster um, understandings of the way that faith informs and inspires giving broadly across religious traditions and across a number of sectors within our nonprofit um, and philanthropic space. So we're delighted to, to listen in and be a part of this conversation and know that as we help to, to build a field of uh, religion and philanthropy, this is an essential part that we hope to foster and continue to grow. So thank you all. So with that, uh, and we'll have each of our uh, panelists introduce themselves and uh, and then uh, make their remarks. And what I'll do is I'll ask Sunita uh, Iqbal uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, lead off. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Sunita Iqbal. I'm from the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Uh, I started in philanthropy about four and a half years ago at the Mellon Foundation, um, specifically working in their performing arts portfolio. Uh, the Cummings Foundation is based in Jewish, the Jewish tradition of giving, and they've always had a social justice lens. Um, it's a family foundation. They are in their fourth generation of board, family board members at this point. Um, so last year, they decided to reframe their uh, grant making, uh, so they did a strategic planning process. And part of that was um, focusing in on climate change and inequality as the two issues that they would like to address with different frameworks. Um, so one of them was is racially, racial economic justice, uh, inclusive clean economy, and I'm on the voice creativity and culture team. So I'm more, I'm more of an arts and culture background, um, but part of that framework, there are two sides to it. One is the arts and culture side, and then the other is religious traditions and contemplative practice. So I've been there for a very little time, since January 19th. <laughs> so I'm still learning uh, a bit about the history, but we're also forming our strategies um, as we go along. And part of what I would like to do, not only talking about how arts and culture can change narratives about Islamophobia and about Muslims more generally, but also I'm trying to get um, a Masa portfolio, Muslim Arab South Asian portfolio for Cummings Together. That's sort of, that I feel like that's my role, what be my role um, in this space. And I didn't think about it before I started working there, but it has um, evolved into this place where I was able to bring Hillary's Fund, who you will hear from there, um, into the fold and hopefully, knock on wood, they'll get um, approved by the board on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naran Khan, and I'm a program officer at the Ford Foundation in New York City. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and I'm especially excited, uh, once we get through all of us, to really talk to you and answer some questions. Um, I think I have a kind of a funny position here in the sense that I feel, uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a, a Muslim American for whom my faith is so important. It, it always has been uh, to my uh, personal and all other aspects of my life, quite frankly, uh, grown up to now. Um, and I now also have a career in philanthropy. And in one sense, uh, the topic of this conversation totally makes sense for me. Um, and in another, it, it doesn't so much in the sense that my own uh, grant making focus is actually uh, you know, quite general. I, I work in the office of the president uh, at the Ford Foundation, and so my grant making is from our kind of flexible, uh, from our flex fund, which you know can span the gamut of uh, not just uh, thematic topics but also geographies. And so, uh, while I do have some really valued and wonderful grantee partners, some of whom are here today, uh, who you know who uh, do this work, that's not the focus of, of what I do. And so, 
uh, I feel deeply connected to this, but it's 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 pretty disparate. Uh, one thing I, I do think it's important to point out is that uh, my own personal civic activism and uh, you know really the kind of roots of my own interest in social justice were with it, organizing within my own mosque community growing up uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in fact, my first encounter with philanthropy was applying for grant funding, you know, for some of our activities once we had, uh, you know, folks from uh, from Bosnia and Kosovo, you know, coming into the community developing programs. So this is, I mean, again, this is, you know, not directly related, but somewhat related. Um, a couple of things I did want to speak to, though, are just, um, you know, in, in not just in this moment, but certainly in this moment, we as an institution focused on fighting inequality are absolutely thinking about uh, American Muslims as a community, and it's not, it's actually, you know, we work in, you know, seven pretty specifically defined thematic areas. It's not just in one area. Your intuitions might tell you that our intersectional, gender racial and ethnic justice portfolio might, you know, might be thinking about this work, and in fact, that is true. But many of our other portfolios are thinking about American Muslims as a community and thinking about community philanthropy as well. And we have a philanthropy portfolio. We think about, uh, we, have a, we have a team called Youth Opportunity and Learning and thinking about you know, next generation leadership that very much touches upon you know, the, the topic of today. Uh, you know, we have an arts and culture portfolio um, uh, called Creativity and Free Expression. There, all of these folks are intentionally thinking about American Muslims and they are thinking about if we as a, as a large uh, philanthropic institution don't have the relationships or even the structures to make small grants, you know, what does it look like to collaborate with folks who do, who are embedded in the community, who can help make informed uh, choices about, you know, where and how funds flow. So uh, I'll, I'll say that on one end. And the other thing I'll say is just, uh, just broadly speaking, you know, I'm really excited by the development of institutions focused on American Muslim philanthropy. Um, it's a long time coming, but it's really exciting that you know that these institutions are being set up and they're being professionalized and run in ways that you know are are the the best possible and most effective ways to uh, engage in this timely topic. And so uh, having you know having you know grantee partners basically <coughs> thinking about the infrastructure of the institutions, how can we invest in the leadership of uh, you know of folks who are you know who are leading these organizations. Um, how to think about the tremendous demands that are placed on them as leaders. And I say that because, you know, uh, and, 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 and we, have, we have some of these leaders here so they can speak to this, but there's a, a lot of, uh, I'm sure they have many requests for demands on their time and to be a representational voice because other than government, philanthropy is really the space where you have an opportunity to have a landscape view of a situation. And so, you know, you want to do the grant making, you want to have your relationships with grantee partners, you want to develop deep relationships, but I'm sure they're like running around being on panels like this. So what does it take to help invest in their leadership and their capacity? And so I think there's just a lot of institutional, institutional infrastructure building questions about these organizations. But uh, but it's kind of a, a problem of abundance. It's an exciting moment, and it's um, so it's it's one. I guess the other side of that coin would just be depressing. So this is great. Like, <laughs> people want to have these conversations. It's a good thing. Um, and you know, a lot of a lot of them are legally staffed. So again, that that contributes to those uh, you know those concerns. Um, and they're they're thinking you know they're thinking about grants you know grant making in, in the community sense, not through a national security lens. And it's a relief to be thinking that way now, I think. Um, and I think they're balancing the short and long term issues. There's a high need for rapid response for vulnerable communities, but life is a long game. And so, you know, we want we want everyone to be thinking about the long term, too. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is just there's such high scrutiny on, uh, on American Muslims as a community. There's high scrutiny on our philanthropy and how we engage. And so just the level of excellence that, that we see in our, you know, in our partners is, is amazing. And, and we want that to continue. And we want, we want more organizations, more diverse thinking. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, have, I have so much more to say. I'm especially excited to listen to your questions and to hear uh, to hear what our colleagues also have to say, but um, I, I think I think I think we're at the beginning of something 
really special, and the intentionality that Jarek, you've brought to this conversation is so important. So thank you all so much. <coughs> Um, thank you, Sharif, for having us here. As uh, Noreen just said, it's a really important beginning point uh, for an incredibly important conversation, and it's a great opportunity for us to evolve. Uh, my name is Eva Rahman. I'm the Senior Program Officer for the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts Building Bridges Program. And um, the um, foundation is housed under the mothership, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Uh, we go by Doris's will, uh, and um, one of her primary concerns was the well-being of Americans and, um, and, and uh, American society. She left in her will uh, the um, directive that the preservation and promotion of Islamic art should continue after her death. And the reason for that is that she was a lifelong Islamic art. She collected for more than 60, more than 60 years, very seriously, and has uh, a sizable collection that is in various museums around the US, but also in a house museum, her former home in Honolulu, in Hawaii, called Shangri-La. So it's a house museum, and it's in partnership with the Honolulu Museum of Art, um, and so that regular dose of tours there, it's also a study center where we have a scholars in residence program, an artist in residence program, and a curatorial studies uh, object preservation program in partnership with the museum. The other dimension of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art is the grant making program, which is housed in New York. And um, there's a program called the Building Bridges Program, which I, I take care of. And our focus is um, again, the well-being of uh, our communities and the way in which we interpret that is to work along the intersections of civic issues, the central civic issues of our, of our era, and how arts and culture can support and advance relationships, connections, and understanding between American Muslims and the broader non-Muslim community. So that's what we pivot on. And um, so, we find ourselves um, in the crosshairs of a very important um, issue, uh, a central issue in the US and around the world, which is Islamophobia. So we also find that we're the sole ongoing program of its kind in the US. We're the youngest within our foundation. We were started in 2007 when the uh, Board of Trustees really felt that it was important to activate a grant making program. Uh, so we're about 10 years old, but also the smallest in the foundation. Uh, we have four other programs. Um, one of them is a medical research program with no animal testing, but Doris loved uh, animals, and she had two pet camels who recently passed away, in fact. Oh. Yes. Um, and also the environment. She cared deeply and um, about that and child well-being and the prevention of child abuse. Um, very central issue to her, and and then the broader arts program, um, which includes uh, contemporary dance, theater, and jazz, all three disciplines uh, that she studied and really cared deeply about. So, um, so those are our colleague programs, and as I said, we're the youngest and smallest um, of uh, of all the programs, the grant making programs in um, in the foundation, and we have found that, that through partnerships, both internal um, and external, uh, many of our colleagues are here, we've, uh, we've partnered together on, on initiatives to really advance this work, has been really beneficial, not just for the expanded financial capacity that it brings with it, but the ideas and perspectives which is really important because it really drives our critical thinking as we think about programmatic strategies um, to, to really be um, supporting effective work in this space. So uh, it is, as Noreen said, a, a very exciting moment. And um, as Sunita said, you know, we're, we're, we're from the art space. She is, I am. I, I spent more than uh, two decades in the field as um, an artistic director and a curator of performing arts and uh, film. 
And now we're, uh, I'm using that um, knowledge and that experience to really think through how uh, the Building Bridges program can be its most effective, given the situation we're in. Um, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kashif Sheikh. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. I had the, the great privilege of, of, of being here last year. So, so thank you, Sharik and the team, for, for asking me to, to, to come back this year. Um, I'm very excited. Um, so so uh, my name is Kashif Sheikh. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Pillars Fund, which is based in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and uh, before I go into a little bit about sort of what we do and sort of how we think about sort of community philanthropy. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of context on, on myself. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, and, and, and uh, sort of activism and sort of social justice has always been a big part of my life, uh, uh, particularly, and I think for me, there was a big turning point in my life. In, in 2001, in Cincinnati, uh, uh, Timothy Thomas, who was an unarmed African American man, was, was killed, and, and uh, it sparked uh, a uh, a lot of riots in Cincinnati and neighborhoods that I used to sort of spend a lot of time in, and it had a profound impact on me. Um, and, and the sad thing is, this was 2001, and, 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 and these stories are, are all too common. They've been all too common for so long. Uh, but I think about that moment quite often, um, you know, especially sort of given the work that I've been doing in philanthropy over the last 10, 11 years. And so, so previous to sort of founding the um, the Pillars Fund. I, um, much like Naran, much like Zeba and Sunita, I, I worked at uh, the McCormick Foundation, which is uh, out in Chicago, um, where they focused on a number of different areas, but my portfolio was really specifically on economic development in low-income communities. So I, I, I did a lot of funding in, um, uh, in Chicago, in the south and west sides of Chicago, uh, in areas of education, particularly post-secondary education. Uh, and so I, I've been in the field for, for a little bit and, and, and have really come to understand and appreciate the power uh, of philanthropy. And so, so with that, uh, about five years ago, um, we had this opportunity to sort of, um, it was all kind of by happenstance. I, I, I happened to meet someone who some of you might know, Rami Nashashibi, who's the founder and executive director of an organization in Chicago called Iman. Uh, and uh, kind of brought me and a, and a handful of philanthropists, uh, young community of philanthropists who had, who had sort of the, the good fortune of, of uh, making some money in their careers and, and were really looking for ways to give back. And many of them were kind of giving, uh, all of them were giving sort of significant amounts of uh, their personal wealth away uh, on a sort of one, uh, one, -on -one, uh, uh, you know, one on one way where Many of them were sort of just working, meeting with organizations and, and sort of seeding them themselves to the tune of 10, 15, 20, 50,000 dollars in their own wealth. And uh, what happened was is that you know in, in 2011, you know we kind of all came together with this idea that that uh, there that, you know it, it was it, we kind of came together because there's this idea that uh, we started sort of recognizing that there was a lot of these community organizations. Um, and then there was a lot of these sort of high net worth donors who wanted to sort of think about contributing, but there was no sort of pathway to, to sort of connect the two because uh, for too long there was such a big disconnect. And uh, a, a lot of that had to do with sort of the, the political situation that was sort of fostered in this country after 9-11. Um, but um, as a result, the Chicago Community Trust, which is I think the, the country's second or third largest uh, community foundation, uh, basically came to us and said, you know, why don't we create a fund, a competitive grant making fund that, you know, uh, you know, all of the donors could sort of contribute their dollars that way and then I could uh, run it uh, sort of as a volunteer because I was performing uh, and, and start to learn about, you know, start to connect the donors and the organizations in a way that everyone sort of felt was a little bit more institutionalized. And so we started in 2011 with about five donors that gave $25,000 Annually, like, and and uh, and um, we and I was sort of running it on, on nights and weekends, and you know, fast forward five years later, and we have 25 donors, I think, who are now contributing an average of thirty-six thousand dollars each, uh, all who just sort of really became enamored with this model of sort of coming together, creating a network, thinking about learning from 
our friends in the Jewish community, the Catholic community, of how, how do you sort of think about community philanthropy, and, and how do you build sort of institutions within our own community that can uh, legitimately interface with philanthropic institutions, and, and uh, most importantly, raise the visibility of our leaders and our, our community organizations. And so, um, so in in the five years that that we sort of grew our organization, uh, we kind of turned around, one of the, my co-founder and I uh, kind of turned around about 12 months ago and said, you know, there's there's a big opportunity here, you know, like we, this sort of little fund that we created six years ago became one of maybe three organizations, uh, less than five definitely, that were kind of, you know, really focused on American Muslim civic engagement. And I think that was the piece that kind of was really important to us is that when we think about the community giving, we think about it sort of in broadly speaking in three buckets. There's sort of our religious institutions, the mosques and the Islamic schools. There's the giving back home. And then broadly speaking, we're talking about sort of civic engagement, the nonprofit sector. And uh, because our community, because the two thirds of the community that's immigrants um, have uh, have not been here for, for very long, our community organizations uh, have been new or under-resourced and, and have a real difficulty in, in accessing funding and, and other types of resources. And so so we, 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 we kind of turned around and, and said, you know, I think we've got the makings of something really interesting here. And uh, what I started doing was um, really kind of leveraging the power of philanthropy and, and philanthropic institutions. You know, given that I was someone that worked in the field for about 10 years, I started having conversations with people um, at the McCormick Foundation and then some of my colleagues at the Kellogg Foundation and, and Ford Foundation and others. And started really, you know, thinking about ways to engage, uh, how they could sort of engage with um, with our community, but um, but also with pillars to think about ways to really encourage uh, more and more um, a community harnessing this idea of harnessing our own wealth. I think there was there was a big opportunity here because pillars have sort of become this institution that has uh, uh, really started to engage with these with these individuals and families. Uh, in, in really meaningful ways, people who sometimes have been giving for a long time, but some people who just have no, who just know that they want to engage uh, with the community in some way and, and, and don't really know how to do it. And so, so real quickly, I think what, what you know, to me, what's really, really important about this conversation is um, to think about the ways that, you know, I, I am a, a really, really big believer in sort of taking control of your own narrative and telling your own stories. I think, I think as Zeba and others have talked about, that is a, a critical piece to creating sort of the social change. And so, you know, one thing that I sort of noticed early on was, as, as Naren pointed out, that there was a, you know, there was a lot of opportunity sort of for, for the reactionary stuff, which is actually very important because, um, because this is a community that I think is directly under attack. But we were also needing to think about what is what does things look like in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and um, we kind of sort of became obsessed around this idea of how do we sort of start helping our organizations, the ones that we're funding, um, really kind of think about the future and sort of start really thinking about institution building. So, so um, I want to just echo what everyone has said. I, I think there, I, I'm, I think the opportunity right now is so incredibly massive. Um, you know, I, I hate to sort of think of, you know, I, I hate to think about the sort of circumstances in which, you know, why people are energized because that, that's the depressing part. But the, re but the reality is that people are energized. People do want to do something. And, and, and I, I often joke that Pillars has sort of become in the business of sort of creating on-ramps. Like, I can't tell you how many people have sort of come and said, hey, we, you know, like, I, I was actually, I literally had people calling me, like, days after the election saying, hey, how can we do something? What can we do? What can we do? And sometimes that's sort of working directly with us. Sometimes that's saying, you know, hey, there's this great organization that does work on the south side of Chicago. You should sort of get engaged with them, however it is. But regardless, I think there is a, a huge opportunity to think about ways to um, really show up in, in sort of the civic arena, um, not just sort of for our own rights, but for the rights of others and sort of stand in solidarity with a lot of our, our brothers and sisters as we think about this work. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation and I'm happy to answer, especially Q&A. So with that, I'll pass it on to Thank you. 
Um, <coughs> good evening, and uh, uh, my name is Farhan Latif. I'm with the Al Hibri Foundation. Uh, thank you, Mark uh, and Shark, for bringing us together, and to my fellow panelists, uh, friends. Uh, and for those of you who have not signed the extra credit sheet, it's at the door. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> How this works. Um, you know, it's uh, it's also an honor to be here on campus as, as a beneficiary of uh, the work that's come out of here on philanthropy and uh, fundraising. And so uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's great to be here. Um, so after you know after 9/11, um, we saw uh, an uptick in hate crimes, and myself as a student on campus, I remember when a professor pushed a student down the stairs. Um, in Michigan, and uh, as a reaction to what was happening in the country. And uh, that student that later came to me and asked for help and said, okay, you know, can you please help uh, advocate and figure out what can be done at this given time? So that became uh, an important moment to start thinking about organizing, and thinking about what one can do as a member of the community. And it was around that time I remember walking into my first Muslim fundraising event, uh, where I you know, I'd walk into this hall, a thousand people, and someone gets up and lays down a really important case about raising money for civil rights, raising money to you know, combat you know, this rising tide of Islamophobia. And the minute the case is completed to be made on stage, you see this imam-like figure come up on stage, the doors get locked, uh, the food stops being served, uh, and they start pitching, hardcore pitching, uh, to give. Uh, and as this fundraising pitch is happening, the imam gets up and says, whoever gives today will get a house in heaven. And if you give 2,000, you'll get a better part of heaven. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you'll, you'll, the property is much better. Uh, <laughs> And I sat there and I looked around and I saw women taking off their rings and putting it in, in uh, you know, in, in the collection boxes and people coming and taking out cash. And I thought to myself, it was an inspiring moment to see the level of commitment of people giving back. And I also thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> uh, and so that there, there became sort of my starting my journey in philanthropy. And I was fortunate to go and then work at University of Michigan. Uh, through the Michigan Difference Campaign, working on the $3.5 billion campaign, and learning more about philanthropy and, and uh, you know, entering the sector. Uh, and so now I'm happy, you know, 16 years later, to be working for uh, a family foundation called the Al-Hibri Foundation. Uh, it was set up by Ibrahim Al-Hibri and his family before he passed away. And uh, the foundation is looking at the question of uh, a better understanding of Islam and Muslims in America. Uh, with some work still being done internationally, you know, with, with orphans. Um, we're based in D.C. Uh, we have a staff of about uh, 10 or so uh, members, and a convenience space that's walking distance from DuPont, or, you know, uh, walking distance from the White House. It's, it's, it's a beautiful place to come visit. And so this foundation is uh, you know, really involved in looking at the question of philanthropy and strategic philanthropy, and uh, the way I would describe it is that we're focused on the ABCs, which is advancing inclusion, uh, intra and intra, building capacity of uh, anchor institutions, Muslim anchor institutions, uh, and then collective action. And that's the question of intersectionality, is how do you connect the dots of people that are working on these different issues. Um, and what I've found is that, you know, um, it's... Uh, we find it often that it's easier sometimes to raise funds for 1.0 organizations, as we call it, which are the mosque, Islamic schools, uh, some international giving, uh, and so on and so forth. But it does become harder to fund civil rights, political, media, advocacy, uh, or issue-based work. And so we're trying to focus our work on organizations, or these 2.0 organizations, and when you do some sort of landscape analysis, what you find is that the thousands of organizations that exist in this country, so many of them are stuck between the $100,000 to $300,000 operating budget. And uh, and yes, many of them are in the first five years, 10, 15, to 20 years. Uh, 
but there's a lot of work to be done. How do you get out of this stage of being stuck in that, in, in that parameter? And so then what ends up happening is that when you hit prime time, like right now, where uh, people are emerging to say, how can we be helpful? How do we help support you and your communities? Or, uh, you know, Tasha was talking about the calls. The two type of calls that I get. One from allies in the country saying, we're ready, we want to support you. Which organization do we back? Which leaders do we support? Or which campaign can we come behind that the Muslim community is leading? Or two, from individuals who, you know, uh, didn't spend a lot of time focusing on their religious identity and cultural identity, but now are being forced uh, or compelled to come out and say, you know, I can't see my community being bullied. I really want to come and help. And what we find is an issue is that how do you take this overwhelming level of support and plug them into these organizations that are in formative stages, that are in early stages of development, and would love their time and energy and support, but don't quite have the infrastructure to take that on uh, often, uh, although these organizations are overstretched and under-resourced. So, uh, you know, so that's definitely one of the questions. When it comes to the question of building capacity, um, Again, we find that uh, the organizational leaders and boards are well intended, uh, you know, are trying very hard to scale, but again, require a lot more investment of time and energy and capacity to learn how to move things along at a faster pace. Um, so, some of the pieces that I feel that are important you know, to conclude is that. Uh, we, we want to still continue building this culture of Muslim philanthropy. We're spending a lot of time with individuals who are um, thinking about starting foundations. Uh, we want to see more prioritization of domestic work that needs to happen, institution building, uh, invest more in human capital, um, and uh, help these organizations even absorb the money. How do you write grants? How do you uh, build and scale organizations, and so on and so forth? And with national organizations, the question of intersectionality, it's uh, how do we see larger foundations today uh, starting to see the bridge that Islamophobia is a leaf on the tree of racism, and then that those are sort of the connections. Uh, and how do you make long-term commitments, not episodic commitments? So when you come out of a funding circle meeting, people are like, okay, well, I'm with this foundation. We should throw $500,000 on this issue for 2017, and we're done. And the question is, no, it's going to take a long-term commitment to move these institution organizations forward uh, and sort of build on them. So uh, I'll stop there, but that's a very interesting conversation to follow. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I, you know, this is the beginning of a conversation, I think, as all the panelists said, that I think we're, uh, we're op we'd like to now open it up for questions from uh, the audience, and uh, and we'll continue this conversation uh, within this broader frame of community philanthropy, uh, mainstream foundations, and this whole issue of, and I, I think as Farhan broadly put it, this idea that Islamophobia and a broader perspective on prejudice and racism. And this is <clears throat> this is an interesting panel because not everyone's coming from the same work community within this space. Um, I see not, so I'm, I'm hopefully more or less on the right track. But um, we have several people who work in large mainstream foundations who may not be working directly on Muslim community philanthropy, but on other aspects of Muslim American life. We have one person from a traditional mainstream philanthropy who is working on aspects of Muslim community philanthropy. Uh, we have uh, someone. Uh, who now in his second appearance here, so we're going to make this a regular event, um, represents a Muslim community philanthropy, uh, explicitly. Um, and uh, another person who represents a private family foundation that is heavily engaged with the Muslim community philanthropy sector. Um, so uh, it's a conversation in which people, I think, are coming at these themes from different work and personal perspectives. And um, uh, Sharif set it up uh, in this way uh, by inviting this group, and I think it makes for a particularly interesting conversation. Um, 
that's sort of my initial thought. Should we open it up and see what uh, see what emerges? And just one small thing. And you have Sunitas, who's with a Jewish uh, <laughs> foundation that is looking to make a grant to a Muslim community foundation. And I think that shows this broad that the intersectionality is broader across uh, you know this the values based approach of looking at Muslim organizations and Islamophobia not as religious organizations but as American as a component of American values. I think Sunita brings that really rich aspect of it. I guess. I must say I was wondering and so I'll sort of kick things up. I was wondering, um, as our speakers uh, spoke briefly now, about the sort of two-edged sword of Islamophobia in the sense that it's something that the community philanthropy organizations uh, and others have to deal with, have to react to. But I wonder whether at some level it's, it's, it's a negative for community philanthropy growth. Um, and um, and it interjects very real political and other complications into the actual process of growing community foundations and community philanthropy. Um, it focuses attention. It needs to be reacted to. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's different from some of the other community foundations and community philanthropy groups that we interact with here at the Little School that aren't facing these kinds of issues and must may just be facing questions of business models and business growth. Um, but Kashi, if you and others are not, you're facing a much more complex set of issues. Yeah, I, I guess I would, I would react to that by saying, and it, it's sort of echoing the point that Farhan made, which I think was a, was a really good point, which was when I think about sort of engagement with uh, institutional philanthropy, I think, you know, having having sort of been in foundations for a long time, uh, I think the reaction is usually, like Ron said, like, let's, let's you know, dedicate you know, X amount of money in 2017 to this cause. And I think what happens there, uh, as I'm sure you guys can deduce, is that once that funding, you know, you, you get an organization, let's say they have a budget of $300,000, and then they get like $50,000 or you know, $75,000, which is an enormous amount of money for them. Um, they can do this great work and sort of combat, and, and, and once that money is gone, they're kind of back to sort of where they need to be. And in many respects, in some cases, they're actually worse off than they were because mm -hmm. um, you know that's a, a you know they can't sort of continue the work that they were doing. And so, so part of you know, and, and there's lots of different approaches that sort of you think about you know uh, there's sort of the approach that different panels are taking um, that I have sort of specifically thought about you know with pillars is that. Um, I, you know, I, I've been sort of uh, really sort of looking at ways to harness the wealth within our own community and creating networks of sort of um, people who want to create and to want to sort of harness their dollars together. And I think that for us has the most interesting thing, and I, I say this to my co-founder every year, um, is that we have now a pool of like, you know, as of last year, about 25 people. And, and some of them we don't hear from, like, we engage with them, we don't hear from all year. And like, come September, I'm like, I've I, you know this person a few times, like, are they? And every single year, like, by December 31st, there's a $25,000 check in the trust, right? There, there's a level of sort of trust that I think has, has, has really developed. And, and, and it's interesting to sort of think about the motivations of why people want to sort of, uh, uh, not to sort of, uh, give to sort of a specific organization because I think what's interesting about Pillars is that I don't think that our donors are looking at it like we're giving to an organization. I think they look at it as like we're coming together to create something and create a network. Um, and I just think that's a little bit different than than um, sort of than, than the, the purview. So, so for us, we think about that specifically, Mark, and I think it's, it's um, you know, and I think we're all going to be in a situation where, you know, there is a lot of this year, and so how do you think about engagement in the long term? And, and you know, as we have sort of, we have sort of supplemented our community dollars with, with foundation dollars, with the sole purpose to sort of stimulate more growth. That's the, the that's the sole purpose, um, because I do approach this as if you know foundation dollars are, are sort of exciting now, they'll be gone, and, and it 
won't affect us in the way because we're literally, you know, telling people, you know, this is great now, you know, you know, we're going to be doing this and all of Questions? Please. Yeah, I'll start with, uh, with you, you're from the family uh, endowment, right? Why don't family you identify that. yourself just so yes, I'm, I'm, the panel knows you personally, right. but, but other people who will be asking questions, the panel doesn't. Know, right. So. My name is Jenny Zaliu. I'm a graphic designer. I work with uh, Imana and uh, Kim, uh, and I'm coming from uh, Chicago area. What um, is Imana? I'm sorry? What is Imana? Imana, Islamic Imana. Medical Imana. Association of North America. Thank yes. You. Uh, so my, my question was uh, uh, briefly, when you mentioned that you're coming from a family endowment or family back or family started fund, does that make a difference on how people get engaged or how, how they get attracted? Does, does that play a role? Does that element play a role in any, any kind of uh, increase in, in people's interests? In, you mean in the by foundation? people, when you're saying people engaged, do you mean? People who are interested in, in helping, helping out or getting engaged with the, uh, with the organization. Um, so, you know, uh, well, our, our work gets people engaged because it focuses on what the project or what we're trying to accomplish. And if people can identify with what's trying to be accomplished, you know, people will come in and, uh, and lend support in, in, in that process. Um, if, if I understand the question. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I, I think that's, that, that's how it tends to work. So, so for example, if we're um, focusing on a project that, uh, that we do, which is on building narratives or, or helping support people share their stories and share their narratives on the work that they're doing, uh, which is a program that we run. Uh, other people will step in and, and uh, want to play a role in supporting that, uh, either participating or by financially getting to it, uh, or by recommending people to come and attend it. So that's kind of our process. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I have a question. <clears throat> I'm Ben Hydersluk. I'm uh, actually an MA student here in school. And my question is, how do we educate our religious leaders in the community to uh, help them understand the philanthropic uh, you know, arm in the community? And then, because we always, when we go to the mosque, we always ask you how to give money to expand maybe the parking or to do something within the mosque, usually, right? So actually, now the, the, the imams and the religious leaders uh, I like to just see them talking about things, like issues beyond the mass, beyond Muslim, only Muslim issues, uh, the whole community, the part of the community. So how, as uh, philanthropic leaders, how can you help our uh, religious leaders to do that? That's a great uh, uh, I, I think there are two things that come to mind for me. One is that, uh, I heard this by some Islamic scholar on speech that he said that uh, zakat, which is a you know a important practice in Islam, its ultimate goal is to get people off zakat, right? Which is this idea that you're giving should ultimately create an infrastructure environment which allows the recipient to uh, financially get to a position that they do not receive, need to receive that money, and that they can actually be the one giving as well. That to me is like a very fundamental piece about building an institution, building an environment, infrastructure that allows for philanthropy not only to be engaged in solving you know, day to day issues, but changing a holistic environment uh, of a community. And so that, that's a religious tradition, and I feel like you know, that's something to um, share back uh, you know, with the Imams uh, and as followers. Um. If I, may, if I may share, and I, and I guess I'm answering in my kind of lay capacity as like a community member. Um, I think there are two spaces that are ripe for, um, for engaging with this. I think one is in terms of governance, and the boards of the masjids have to be key to, uh, to understanding community needs. And by extension, I actually just think it's 
uh, community demand for kind of hol more holistic services will push boards and imams to respond. Now, there's such high variance in like sophistication in, of governance structures or um, you know how built up and sophisticated like the institutions are themselves. But I can imagine that like if a community demands things, their leadership will respond. Um, and I've seen that just. I've seen that happen over the course of you know, different communities in which I've been engaged. So, so really, if you distill it down, it's like how do you get community like communities more engaged, so that they such that they decide that they have a bigger vision for what they what they want, uh, what role they want the mosque uh, to have in their not just religious life but civic and community building life. Um, so I, I hope that answers, yeah. I'd like to, to build on what both um, Farhan and Lurin have said and, and um, add this notion of uh, having a Catholic sense um, and uh, of culture, a broader sense. I don't mean uh, in terms of the spiritual philosophy, but actually, yes, the, the values that come with um, a broader sense of culture is needed. I mean, we um, the specificity uh, is narrow, right? So the conversation's been really narrow. Now the next uh, phase is to really open up and expand thinking um, and look at those intersections where the community can connect and should connect. So um, expanding the, the view is really important. And that comes with, with um, you know, um, education as well, um, experience as we know. Uh, I'm thinking of the whole, um, the group of Muslim chaplains in universities. Perhaps they can play a role because they're on, they're on campuses that have great diversity um, and have a view that could really help to work with the, the specific community-based imams. I mean, the, the rise of, of um, the imams in our communities and mosques um, came from a need when the Muslim community, the immigrant Muslim community, <coughs> realized that their kids were becoming teenagers and very quickly their attention was being diverted by um, jumping hormones and, um, and uh, um, certain influences from their peers in schools. And so there was a shift, a cultural shift, where um, you know um, broadly cultural uh, Muslim community members suddenly um, the women started wearing hijab. They they started to look around for uh, a mosque that they could send the kids to, or somebody who could educate the kids um, uh, in religious studies. And and uh, volunteers came forward. So there was no, it was, it was an ad hoc sort of moment um, in, the in the life of the community. And there were all kinds of people that, that were brought on to um, teach the kids uh, because it was largely a volunteer position. Um, and busy professional parents didn't have the time or didn't have the knowledge. Um, so they handed over responsibility to these volunteer imams. Eventually that expanded, they, they started to pay them something and so on. So it, it, it grew from there on the, the, the um, community level um, and has had varying results. Um, I know for a fact somebody who sent their children to uh, a Sunday school in Westchester, a community leader, um, and one of the children was indoctrinated by this imam to go and fight in, um, in the war. And um, he went off uh, overnight to Pakistan to a training camp and um, blew himself up. He was trying to make a bomb or something. And uh, it was a wake up call in, in the life of, of uh, the American Muslim community. Um, and a great deal of reflection, and that has been corrected. They, they established a family foundation and, and uh, uh, very concerned with this issue. So my point is that, that there, uh, there are varying kinds of imams, and they need some professional development and some personal development also. So, so I think this is where the, the uh, Muslim chaplains from universities can actually play a role, um, because they have the knowledge base. 
can have the same reward if you give for other causes, not only to build a mosque or, or expand the path and path, right? So that's the understanding, the shifting of the understanding of the Muslim community to know that the leaders need to play a role in conveying the message to our Muslims, right? That's right. So you give to uh, homelessness or to uh, refugees, it's, these are the same reward as giving to the mosque. To that's right. Can I follow up just for a minute by asking sort of directly, not for the private foundations in the room, but for Kashif and for the American Muslim Fund, we have a representative, uh, um, whether, whether the mosques view you as a competitor in fundraising? Um, and Professor Alexander, who's next to me, could say probably something about this in Catholic or Jewish communities when these kinds of organizations got started in those communities too, but uh, do you get pushback from mosques that see you as a competitor for fundraising? Or is the community so broad and the umbrella so broad that everyone's sort of doing their own thing? It's a good question. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't go, you know, I, I haven't had any direct conversations with mosques to sort of, you know, to, to sort of whether or not there might be some sort of feel that way, but I can tell you that uh, the reason it, it's not something that's sort of on top of my mind often is because the people that sort of we engage with have not really been involved. In, like, they're, most of them are not giving to their mosques in any sort of significant, significant way. Um, I think there is the appeal for something like like pillars is because they feel like the um, sort of community institutions that currently exist aren't sort of um, speaking to the needs that they sort of see and and that's not a uh, that's not maybe a comment on the mosques but that's that's the reality of the situation is that uh, you know it, it, it's not that you know I, I don't know any of our donors who've said you know we give twenty five thousand to the mosque and now we're going to give uh, twenty five to pillars and not give anything to the mosque like you know um, so we'll say what sure uh, my name is Muhi Kwaja. Um, very in the infancy stage of establishing a community foundation called the American Muslim Fund. Um, but I think it's even beyond uh, partnering with mosques, it's educating um, nonprofit organizations and the community as donors um, that it's a partnership. You know, it's not that we're trying to steal money from causes, we're trying to empower <clears throat> organizations uh, to provide them the institutionalized um, capacity to, to do the mission that they are set out to do. So I think it's a it's a partnership in um, helping nonprofits and helping donors uh, meet their philanthropic goals. Um, I'd love to hear from the panel about the recent gift to Notre Dame. Oh yeah. Sorry, It was fifteen million dollars. Do you have thoughts about you know? Would it have made the New York Times if it had been given to a mosque? What was the significance <laughs> of this? Well, um, For those who don't know about it, one of you might say a few words about what the gift was. Sure. There, there was a family that uh, recently, there was a New York Times article, a family that had uh, made a $15 million donation to, to Notre Dame. Um, uh, and it was it was it was it was, a, it was a sort of traditional American Muslim family um, that had been of the community, um, I believe, uh, immigrants who had come here and and, um, and and sort of made this pretty massive contribution. I, mean, I, I guess to me, it, it's a it's a really good question around would it have made the the, the news better it was the mosque. I mean, I I don't think it would have truthfully because I think what pillars is sort of what we've been. Part of the impetus of what we've done is um, that story when when it was sort of sent to me was not, and I don't think for, for many of us probably was not that surprising because we know that wealth sort of exists within the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, I think that there's what's happening is as as sort of we've talked about sort of this generational shift, like you know, like when you think about like. Um, uh, the sort of immigrant community who are who primarily came here in the 60s and 70s and sort of now are thinking about philanthropy and, and sort of, or, or, or legacy building for, for lack of a better term. Um, 
it's not surprising because I think that's one of the, the sort of misconceptions of American Muslims sort of in, 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 in the countries that we are sort of a very philanthropically engaged community, not just within sort of our own institutions, but um, you know, like if it, you know, if I were to sort of bring the, the a handful of, 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 of donors for pillars here, you'd see sort of how active they are in whether it's their universities, whether they're sort of with their uh, sort of everything down to their own mosques or whatever it might be. Um, not uh, other sort of, uh, so I think that, I think what was really interesting about that though was like how much press it got. Like I think there was like, there's this, this the, like that was the piece of the story that I think, you know, like I don't think anyone was that surprised, like oh, it's a family giving a lot of money, but like the level of, of, of sort of press that that story got was really fascinating because it sort of went into the, the, the backstory of who they were and, and, um, I think it kind of opened up a lot of eyes to sort of, and it's actually stories like that. When we talk about narrative shift, when we talk about narrative building, that's kind of like partly what we're talking about is like, how do you sort of get those types of stories? Because um, I guarantee that's not the only family that has made sort of multi-million dollar contributions to universities, right? You know, there's also sort of a political moment right now that's, that's going on that, that's sort of serving to this. Sorry, sorry. Anyways, I'm, I'm talking to you myself. <laughs> <laughs> Does everybody know what this? The purpose of this gift was? No. Yeah, to fund an institute on uh, yeah. the engagement, global engagement with religion. Yeah. Okay. Was the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, which opens up lots of interesting yeah. questions about who's doing the engagement and which religions are we talking about, especially since global can be a dog whistle for everything but uh, you know, kind of the US American Christianity, yeah. things like that. So. But I, I was sensitive to the title of the, at least in the online, unorthodox. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, just being sensitized to, to various Islamophobic narratives, an unorthodox gift. You know, and, in, and given how the term orthodoxy is used in religious yeah. parlance, you know, and then to suggest that, you know, this isn't something that a Muslim would typically do. Uh, maybe it's about Notre Dame. But maybe it's about this, you know, kind of open uh, attitude towards, you know, religious engagement and all that kind of stuff. It's just that the article is kind of strange. It's it's great in some ways, but it's also uh, troubling in some other ways. Yeah. I would, uh, um, um, you know, uh, my name is Thay Yunus. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and last night uh, actually Shara called me a social entrepreneur after I <laughs> described my company. So I guess that's, that's what I am from here on out. Shara does have that effect. Yeah, I'm yeah. 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 a moral yeah. 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 I, I, I agree with, 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 uh, with what Gosh is saying in that I don't think that this is the first time a, donate, a Muslim has made a donation like that. And in an earlier discussion, we were talking about capturing the Muslim narrative, the story of philanthropy. I think part of the challenge, or the reason why the story has been locked up in a box for the most part, and we haven't heard about it so often, is because one of the, one of the principles in Islam is to give from your right hand so your left hand doesn't know. So a lot of the giants are ghosts. So we're not going to know who they are and where they gave it. I think part of the reason why this Duke news was so loud, I, and this is just me, me guessing my theory, uh, one, uh, I agree with Gosh again in that it's because of the climate. Uh, and number two, Duke's got a great press team. You know, Third 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> All of you guys have a great press <laughs> team. <laughs> I was thinking of Duke because we were talking about it last night, but you guys, you know, you guys have great press teams, and you're trying to, you know, get other Muslims to, to donate who are alums of that school. Uh, uh, you know, I went to Illinois, so um, you know they're 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 always calling and saying, hey, you need need to donate. I told um, one of my professors that you know one day either me or my son we're gonna be the first Muslims to have our name outside a building, uh, and I said I'm gonna do that. So so. <laughs> Guys, so but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the challenge in what in, in capturing the narrative and capturing that story. One of the things that um, um, 
we say now, I heard this from, from one speaker, and he was saying, he was talking about, he was teaching to an audience of Muslims, okay? And he was basically saying the same thing, that we've got to, the way we're going to change the opinion of the masses is by doing social service, by demonstrating, by telling our real narrative. Um, and even though in Islam it says, give from your right hand so your left hand doesn't know, he said, I want you to be humble, but be loud. <laughs> so that's what I tell people. I, I pass that along. Zeebert, did you want to say something about the lyric here this one? No, I think we've covered it. <laughs> David, please, a question, because uh, maybe not all of you, but what I heard from, from many of you was not only are you uh, helping shape the field of, of philanthropy in these different forms, whether community foundations, private family foundations, but it also you're also, uh, much of your time is, is spent on the phone with, with nonprofits and other philanthropists and foundations and community partners. You're actually seeding these conversations and are bringing wisdom to the table. Um, in trying to, to network and create some of these um, environments that we've been talking about. And that, I, while that's always a part of uh, philanthropy and foundation's role, I think that seems to be somewhat unique in the particular place where you are. That, that imagine that takes up uh, a large percentage of your time that's unaccounted for by your board or even your donors. In some ways, maybe uh, you might not have signed up for that vocational, professional part of your work. And I, I'd love for you to maybe just reflect on how that fits into your particular roles. Yeah, so I remember uh, attending uh, Exponent Philanthropy Conference. Uh, there was this conversation of outsized impact. And I feel the work on sector building, on <coughs> speaking to partners, and uh, convening, uh, at least convening to share, expanding the role of the conversation. I feel as a way of having outsized impact as an organization because our philanthropy, um, from a community standpoint, from a relative community standpoint, is, is very large. But when you look at it from a philanthropic standpoint, it's actually very small. And so this is one way of uh, expanding the conversation and allowing others to have a chance and opportunity for, uh, to play a role. So I think it's it's definitely part of our work and. and uh, or is happy about this work. So. Other point, yeah, please. Um, so last year, the Ford Foundation held a one-day convening on Islamophobia of a year ago. Um, and you know, to be upfront, I'm culturally Muslim and not religious. So um, my relationship with the Muslim identification is very different from I think everyone else on this on this panel. But there was something about, in terms of talking about Islamophobia, there was something about this, the justice part of it, right? Like, I know that there's so much better things, so many better things happening in our communities. That's what I grew up with. You know, my mom, I would say, she's like a social worker. She's Hindu, but I, she went to heaven and definitely, you know, is up there because she put together 17 marriages in our community, like those kinds of things. Um, you see that happen all around you, and somehow those narratives are lost. I think within philanthropy, what I realized after that board convening is that they don't know where to put their money, and they don't know who to ask these questions to either, right? So, you know, sitting in the role that I do, I always saw philanthropy or being in philanthropy and bringing organizations to the table is that I'm an advocate. So if I'm not advocating for my own community, then I'm not really doing my job. I luckily landed in a foundation where I can do this a little bit more than I could at the Mellon Foundation. Um, but I think that's a big part of it, is that philanthropists don't know, you know, we we're talking institutional philanthropy, they don't know where to put the money. And there's not enough information out there to understand what are the better investments to make, right? So I think we, we all sit in a unique role that we can bridge that gap a little bit. Um, and I think that's the start of a different part of this movement is bridging that gap finally and showing that 
There is a Muslim culture, but that we're, there is also the American culture that fuses with the Muslim culture, and people are forgetting that there's that, you know, the, that side of it. Um, I don't know if that I'd just like to add to what Sunita said. Um, given where um, the Dharashtri Foundation for Islamic Arts sits, and, and the Building Bridges program in particular, uh, we feel very strongly we have a very important role to play, as I said earlier, we're the sole ongoing um, organization, um, a program of its kind in the US. And um, we support project initiatives that use arts and media to uh, make a difference between communities. Farhan used uh, in, in turn intra-community work, and that's exactly how we view it, although we're a quote-unquote mainstream organization. Um, and so <clears throat> really the Building Bridges role is to be an advocate of the arts approach for inter- and intra-community work. Uh, among Muslim and non-Muslims, and also within the Muslim community. Um, and um, again, to follow what Sunita said, yes, the Ford Foundation had a very important meeting a year ago on Islamophobia, and we uh, followed that in partnership with the Ford Foundation and some of our other colleagues um, a couple of weeks ago that uh, focused on the, the use of the arts approach um, the impact of the arts approach on issues of prejudice and Islamophobia. So it's important to um, keep the, the long view um, in mind and sustained advocacy uh, for the states. To sort of directly adjust real quickly, and it goes back to the point that Farhan had made earlier, which was people. So, so because our sort of community institutions are often sort of in their infancy, or, or maybe not even in their infancy, but are uh, in that one to three hundred thousand dollar sort of budget range that Ron had mentioned, um, it just requires a, uh, it just requires a, a level of, of um, engagement that I think uh, isn't you know. So, like this role that I'm in is very very different than when I was at the Muhammad Foundation. You know, I was I was often working with. 10, 15, 20 million dollar nonprofits, national nonprofits that are working on lots of different issues. It's a different conversation. I don't think they're any better or worse, um, but it's just a different conversation to be having um, with them. And so I think the and, and 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 the reality too is partly why the work that everyone here is doing is so important is because many of those organizations have, have often not. I, I you know it really makes me happy to see. A lot of our community organizations are now gaining access to sort of foundation dollars, whether it's through the boards of the world, and the Kings of the world, the Pillars, the Pillars, or whatever it is through. Um, that was something that you know, 10, 15 years ago, was was so so incredibly limited, if, if even happening at all. And and so, um, but I think that's I think that's sort of the added. It's an, it's a, it's a good observation because it is an, it's sort of an added layer of, of this work that um, frankly I sort of anticipated um, but not fully anticipated. Um, it was so great that I actually had to hire someone to basically do just that um, because it is it's it's it's, it's it can almost be. A, Please. So this is kind of building on that type of question, but how do you engage uh, more traditional blue-collar types of communities um, in terms of the rhetoric and the misconceptions of your guys' space in general, as the philanthropists in particular? But how do you more of a willing ear in the academics and some of the more elite nonprofit types of organizations? But how about how do you engage the people within, you know, the traditional blue-collar who are not necessarily as willing initially to hear what you have to say? I would, I would like to respond Please. to that. Yes. Um, late last year, um, my program made um, a grant a pilot for, a, for a pilot project to the University of Iowa's uh, Creative Writing Program, which is a very respected program. And they have um, the International Writing Program, then they have the, right, the Creative Writing Program. And it was specifically to the International Writing Program for this reason. that. Um, they did um, a writer's residency, a 
full emotion residency with Turkish and Armenian writers. Mm. That was uh, difficult, but very powerful. And by bringing those those two groups together, um, you know the history. Uh, it put them into a very intimate uh, several week situation where they were eating and sleeping um, uh, and waking together and studying certain texts together and then producing uh, their own writing based on that experience um, in some shape or form. And it had uh, ultimately uh, a very strong impact because they created uh, it created relationships between the two groups. And those, many of those relationships have endured. They continue to stay in touch um, uh, after this, uh, this residency. So uh, the head of the International Writing Program is uh, this summer going to do uh, this pilot writing residency for high schoolers from uh, white, blue collar, um, communities and American Muslim high schoolers. And they are going to bring them together in, in Iowa. Um, as you know, the city itself is blue, but, but the state is red now. Um, and they're going to use the same model. And they're going to work with um, a Canadian Muslim faculty member and, and others who do this work um, to, again, throw them together, have them um, live in the same dorms, and uh, read very specific texts um, to really drive their, to expand their critical thinking, and then have them write, to express their, their feelings in writing. Um, and then they'll, they'll measure the, the impact of that and, and give us the results. That, I mean, has a very particular intention, that, that um, initiative. And uh, I'm very excited to see uh, what happens. I think it's going to be, uh, I'll be out there actually to, to be a fly on the wall to, uh, for that residency. Uh, I think it's going to be challenging, but I think it has potential, some very interesting potential. Um, so coming from a Jewish Family Foundation now, um, I'm learning a little bit more about interfaith work and a lot of the work um, that's being done is getting sort of the leaders of um, different religions that are maybe on opposite ends of the spectrum together to speak to their communities about sort of that bridge building. Because a lot of it can come from the heads of um, religious organizations. The other path, which just feels instinctual, um, generally speaking, is children, right? Kids going through, like, getting them at a younger age. And if anyone's going to change the hearts and mind of someone who has something ingrained in their head, it's going to be their kids and the younger generation. That's it. I've seen that happen with a lot of parents where their mentality changed about things because their children framed it to them in a, in a certain way and they were able to see, see it in a different way. Um, so I think those are two paths that no one really talks about too much, but it's definitely there and they're just I know that at NCF we're looking to make a more concerted effort to make that happen. Um, so. Other comments on reaching out to blue collar folks? I think I would, I would definitely echo uh, the mention. Interfaith has been one uh, access point to reaching different communities, and uh, you know, we've been doing work on that. And as a matter of fact, uh, when you do interfaith work, one of the questions that comes up is what kind of interfaith work? There's almost like 20 definitions of interfaith work. I'm sure you probably talked about that last night. Uh, so how do we reach and access communities that are not part of the conversation often uh, is the topic at hand. But the second point I would say that um, we're actually open to seeing, especially given the national dialogue and discourse, it has an impact if you think about Know, where is going to be missing? Where is our work missing? And so we're actually open to um, finding projects uh, and organizations and leaders who are interested in actually helping doing some of the building work. And we'd be open to seeing those proposals when we open up our grant cycle. So if you, you know, or anybody here knows about some of those projects, we're actually interested in doing those. Many 
huge mistake. So that's like the million dollar question, right? Like, I guess she kind of keeps me up at night. It's like, if we're just, are we just sort of taught preaching to the choir? Like, in, in 20 years from now, or, you know, might, are we just sort of having conversations with people that already sort of feel this way? And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, there's a couple of different approaches. You know, I think, obviously, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I also think there needs to be sort of uh, a broader conversation around sort of how, when we're talking about American Muslims, like how American Muslims are sort of portrayed in like everyday life, like and that's like through through pop culture, through sort of media, through, through Hollywood. Um, I think that you know a lot of these things have to work in tandem because you can, you can sort of really reach you can really reach a lot of people through popular culture in a way that I think. Um, that a lot of other mediums don't have. The, the, you know, like I, I, when I look at, when we sort of look at the ways that the LGBTQ community is sort of, sort of framing their narrative, uh, no one would say that you know, pop culture was the, the reason why that happened, but it certainly was a key strategy in terms of helping shift the ways that that community was perceived all you know, in a short amount of time. You know, you're talking about the AIDS crisis in the early 80s to like, going out to like Ellen coming out, which I think was in 97, which I received very well to, to now Ellen being like the, the most popular celebrity in the country. I think there's I think there's real real value in, in thinking about ways that we're, we're sort of portrayed. And that's something that we think about a lot. Like, you know, one of the things that we've, you know, as I know everybody on this panel, we, we, we try to get together as often as we can to sort of think about, you know, what everyone else is doing and sort of where we can help or what directions that we can take that maybe other people don't have the capacity to take. And, and um, um, yeah, I, I think we're all kind of really concerned about that particular. I mean, this, I think this election was a result of a lot of people sort of speaking to their own audiences and not So it, it's a great question. And I'll just add, um, in, my, in my work with other social movements, um, especially labor, um, there's been a real uh, embracing of uh, just intersectional solidarity, um, taking on Islamophobia. So I think I think <coughs> if labor is a part of the conversation, organized labor and any other movement organizing in that space, I've just been really surprised by the uh, the like the deep deep level of commitment and opportunities in that space. And I, I really hope that that's not just a a part of this immediate. Um, moment, but kind of a long-term, uh, I hope people invest in those relationships and see where that goes. And real quickly, uh, Kashik mentioned uh, the pop culture sort of route. Um, there is actually a pop culture collaborative uh, that just, we've just uh, gotten our ED in place. Uh, NCF is part of it. It's, it's starting in about a year to really launch, but part of that will be talking about changing Muslim narratives in Hollywood, like the working group is going to have a discussion about that. How do you get some of these experts into the room with the writers um, to give a real portrayal of what Muslim culture is, not what you know the standard terrorist narrative is, right? Um, so that is actually actively happening. And I think that is a way, when you look at it, you know, to, Television is the one thing that people, <laughs> everyone sort of engages with. So when, even if it's not, even if they don't actively think it, it's somehow in their subconscious, hopefully, drilling something <clears throat> into it, right? Um, so. Scott, <laughs> just, okay, this is, this is going to sound like a bitch. Yeah, I'm Scott Alexander from the Catholic Theological Union. I'm also on the, um, the Lake Institute uh, Advisory Board. Um, this is going to sound like a pitch. It's not really, but just to sort of understand how this is, uh, it, you could all work. Um, do your organizations uh, grant money uh, to institutions with a certain capacity to, d to then do mini grants themselves in order to see this work? I mean, that's something that some of you it's do. It's an important work. part of what we do because we don't have the, you know, and, yeah, yeah, jump the band. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because you know, there was a recent uh, study that we commissioned out of the, the Bridge Initiative at Georgetown, um, studying uh, it, attitudes towards Islam among Roman Catholics. And the, one of the findings was that uh, uh, the, the Catholics who read Catholic literature uh, 
from Catholic publications about Muslims and Islam are more likely to have negative attitudes towards Muslims than Catholics. Go. And there was a lot of other revealing data about percentages, and that you know it's disturbing. Um, the church is in a place where officially, with church teaching, this should all be about dialogue and mutual understanding. This famous church document says the church regards with esteem the Muslims. That's out of Second Vatican II. And there's really no equivocation on that on some very basic level. Uh, but so far, there's been no effort, you know, to sort of uh, look at the landscape of Catholic parishes across the United States. You know, like in a city like Chicago, but then across the United States, and you know, offer uh, grants uh, for religious education folks, you know, who have a vision for reaching some of the people that you're talking about, who populate lots of different Catholic parishes uh, across this country. Uh, and it just, it just seems like it, there might be, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of the Muslim Journeys Initiative um, uh, of the American Library Association that was done at libraries, but to sort of try to replicate that on a, on a, on a parish basis. But, but that's something that could work. Huh? I mean, the, the Muslim Journey was funded by the Building Bridge. Along Carnegie also was, the was a lot of the NEH. Um, yeah. yeah, and it came under fire. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know it's part of it, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, I think that religious literacy um, is really needed. Uh, because the interpretation of uh, the um, literature of uh, spiritual philosophy determines the course of our lives. I mean, through the cycles of civilization, we've seen this play out again and again. And we come to the same point again and again. When it says literalism, we have one issue. Um, when there's a broader, more humanistic interpretation. We have a different kind of, of culture and mindset. And, and that those are the two points that we keep rubbing up against, um, those two perspectives. So it's very important. But there, there are uh, funders that focus specifically on um, supporting these kinds of initiatives. And then there are those uh, that actually will combine and collaborate with, with say, uh, other kinds of funders, you know, with different focus areas to to support issues like that. You know, um, so it can be both. Um, you probably know some of those funders, given your subject area. But more are stepping forward now to collaborate along the intersections. Intersectionality is becoming really. Buzzword. <laughs> Suddenly. 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 Which is it's been around for a while. It's been around yeah, for a while. but it's really popping in the philanthropic community yeah. anyway. You hear it all the time. Along because with so the many, cohort. there are so many cross-cutting individuals of identity <laughs> that experience oppression, and then they're they layer on top of each other. So like, there's no right or moment. I mean, it's a buzzword, but for a reason. Like, like, Absolutely. my goodness, how many different vulnerable communities can experience? <laughs> Uh, so much at once, so uh, absolutely. Comes out of black black American woman. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Kimberly Crenshaw. Yeah. Yes, her. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One one question I have for the panel is uh, this: you know, the role of foundations, right, and role of philanthropy, and traditionally there are many, uh, but arguably one is, of course, to give money and sort of help organizations along. The other is to build capacity. It's not through money, but you know, through the advice that you give and the connections that you make. But I think, at least in my view, one of the most uh, important roles philanthropy has played is that of innovation or risk taking. And, and that seems to be somewhat in, uh, in a modern foundation, the way, the way the modern foundations are looking at this, there's this huge tension on whether that's true. And you know, there are arguments on both sides. But, one question I have for you guys is, it seems to me within the Muslim community space, there aren't enough risk takers, right? And that's the problem that, that's facing, and that's why the parking lot is so important in, in terms of, like, and you know, the ISPUs, the UPFs, right? All the risks, the biggest risks taken were by individuals. And we know from research that, you know, Individuals only have in so much money and only so much capacity to take the risks. And so my question is, how important is 
that element in terms of this risk element in terms of the way you think about Muslim community in the space and philanthropy? Because, uh, because at, least, at least when I think about the American Muslim landscape, I see a lot of traditional stuff, right? A lot of advocacy stuff, a lot of mosques, a lot of relief organizations, a lot of schools. I see very few of the UPFs and the ISPUs, just to pick on two, right? And I think, uh, so, and I'm wondering whether that's because there haven't been enough risk takers taking, uh, sort of stepping up. Well, at the risk of, if you don't mind me jumping no, in, at the risk of just reiterating what you what you said, in, in, when you experience scarcity, uh, it can go one of two ways. You can just, uh, you can, you can try anything because you're just so desperate, or you can, uh, you want to feel safe. And I think, uh, you know, we haven't talked about some of the really challenging moments post 9-11 when it came to philanthropy and the real persecution and scrutiny of a lot of giving within the community that caused trepidation, that caused, uh, I mean, I would say that it was formative for so many yeah, people and how and, and shaping and I, I'm actually surprised we haven't talked about it yet but like that shook everyone up and so yeah like for good reason people are not interested in taking risks there's such high level of scrutiny when it comes to giving where when who who's involved you can't control everything and so I actually really do understand that but I think that that makes the obligation on um, institutional funders rather than individuals. I, I just feel like there's, you know, we ought to have the appetite for risk. We ought, I mean, I think about this and all of the grant making we do institutionally, like a certain, you have to expect a certain level of failure and just like, you know, oops, like oops, <laughs> and, uh, and rewarding, rewarding the things that go really well and forgiving the, the moments. So I, I'm so glad you raised that. Like, yeah. that, you know, now is the moment not to be scared and, and curl up, but to take risks. And one of the best ways to mitigate that is to work together um, with, you know, in, in collaboration with folks who you may sometimes work with all the time, new people. Um, I think it's a really exciting moment for that as well. And I think within philanthropy, um, you know, there is an organization, there's a cultural shift happening. Right. You know, younger generation of uh, people working in, in foundations are coming in and they have different ideas. Um, and, you know, these are traditionally white institutions that have been operating in a certain way and have not looked at inclusivity or diversity as much as they should have uh, up until this point. Um, so I think part of it is that culture needs to shift from the inside, and I think that's it's just gonna take some time. And the, I mean, I, I'm talking from the arts perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I've am i been in the process of trying to find Muslim artists to get them together, and it's actually a really hard thing to do. You think a network exists, it doesn't. And a lot of people just don't wanna associate themselves with Muslim because part of the reason is if they try to get funding for any of their projects, there's always a stigma associated with that work. Um, and trying to embrace it and get funding, there's there's uh, some sort of cultural misunderstanding happening where people don't understand the project, uh, sorry, funders don't understand the projects as well, and they're not willing to take the risk because they don't understand it. They just think it's too um, uh, vague of a project instead of, you know, looking at it from a different lens. And you can't look at it from a different lens if we're not changing the culture from within, right? Um, go ahead. I wanted to add to the point that that Naren mentioned, which was, I think, is she, you're right, I'm surprised it hasn't actually come up because, and it's actually a critical piece of the pillar story that I didn't actually bring up, um, which was um, <clears throat> part of the reason why pillars sort of exist was because you know, when I talked about that disconnect, that disconnect wasn't because the donors and the organizations didn't know each other. The disconnect was because there was such a level of fear. Like, you know, like the 9-11, the Patriot Act sort of shook this community that when you have uh, people that we were working with who are sort of high level, whether executives or running their own funds or whatever it might be, um, they can't afford even like the slightest bit of an organization that's sort of accused unfairly of, of any type of, of, of you know, 
whether it's domestic terrorism, financial impiety, whatever it might be. So the partnership with the Chicago Community Trust was actually critical in our early days because, you know, and I, and I, I have to give so much credit to Terry Mazzani, who is this incredible leader uh, who came to us six years ago and said to us with a group of people and said, we, I, Terry Mazzani, and the Chicago Community Trust have your back. And the level of comfort that gave for donors, to, and, and to be completely honest, it's funny that that that, that was there, but that sort of selling point, I guess, uh, around the CCT relationship was sort of waning a little bit over the last couple of years, but in the Trump administration, every single one of our donors has come to us and say, we're still with this, we're still with CCT, right? We're still partners with CCT, right? Um, and, and it's true, and it's and it's because because it's really, really important. Um, for, for us to sort of understand that piece within the context of risk taking, because you know um, it's it's really hard. But what, on the flip side of that, um, what I am seeing, listen, I think pillars exist because of the generosity of our individual donors five years ago who sort of came together to create this. But in in the last recent year, it's because of people like Ford, it's because of people like Kellogg who are taking a massive risk on us. This is my my co-founder and I have been you know we joke like we we just sort of been like like in our suits like hustling in New York trying to like get people to like care about what we're doing and 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 uh, there were there were like you know weeks where we would just sort of uh, be there talking to a bunch of people and and we're very 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 fortunate that that you know given how you know despite us being sort of doing this for five years but you know sort of the new vision of this uh, it very much is a risk, you know. It's it's. No, well, not though. It's like not like when I say risk, I mean like real palpable risk. Yeah. Like you got, I mean like you run such a efficient, well done shop. Like that's not. I don't mean you, to say it's I, not yeah, risky. Yeah, yeah. For I mean it's political capital sure. and other sensitivities you're managing, but it's yeah. not. Yeah, but well, I would more agree. That, thank you. Uh, <laughs> not everybody agrees with that. So. <laughs> uh, but meaning that what I mean by that is, and I, I, I well, thank you for the kind words, but really just the idea that there is sort of still an early stage idea that that they haven't engaged with, you know, like Nathan Cummings, I think, is a perfect example of, of, of an organization. I, I have a, you know, it's so exciting to see this, then bringing out to Nita to say, like, this is what we want to do. Um, and they're being so incredibly thoughtful about how they want to engage, um, that doesn't always happen. And, and I think that it kind of goes hand in hand. Our community, um, this you know, I'm sensitive to their sort of risk taking because we do need to take more risk. I completely agree. Uh, but it, you know, I, I left a, a very stable job to do this. And so <laughs> it's also very, very scary. So I get it from both ends. I think, you know, Pillar's got the funding from Kellogg and from Ford. There's always field shifts. When the big guys do something, then everyone else follows. That that's just a that's just how philanthropy works, right? And I, I saw that theme sitting at Mellon doing arts uh, performing arts grants, how the Mellon name really leveraged other sources of funding for these organizations, which is important. So it's we're in a moment where that's finally happening a little bit more in the risk taking, but I also have this um, argument that like we can't, and in terms of artists especially, I'm like we can't ask them to bend to our rules anymore. Like this is not a space where that that um, framework works for these um, this <clears throat> population. So we need to start bending to their needs a little bit more in terms of what where we're putting our money, where we're investing, and trying to have the most um, impact that we can have with those dollars. You really brought out the passion in that show. That exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Let's maybe take one more question and then end a few minutes before three so that especially people at the school who would like to meet our panelists or some of the other guests here can do that. And please. Uh, Pat Dan, hey Jen, and I'm a third year doctoral student in the philanthropic studies program. Is, uh, in, in my mind, I'm asking myself, is there something that you would identify that is very different about Islamophobia today as compared to after 9-11? Because what I'm hearing is that you are in the process of institutional building. It might feel weak, but it still exists. The networks that weren't there before are there now. Is there a national consciousness of overall, when I say national American consciousness, of contributions of Muslim Americans on a general basis. And how is Islamophobia different today that affects your reactive work, number one, and your long-term work? 
I, I'll just kick off real quick. I think, you know, I think people have right different thoughts. I think, um, I guess, I guess we've already been getting political, but I assume that's okay here. Um, I think one of the big differences in today's world is that um, some of the most sort of ardent anti-Muslim, anti-sort of Islam activists have a direct line to the White House and have a direct. In some are in the White House. Sebastian Gorka is in the White House. And I think that I think that has sort of taken on a very sort of new reality for for Muslim communities. You know, um, it is it is incredibly um, it's it's very very concerning to see some of these people you know tweet out pictures of them sort of you know in the White House and. Um, because they're hate creatures, right? They, 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 and and so I think that's you know there's a, a lot there's a lot of different ways to answer that question, but I'll just sort of say that piece of it is from sort of just a community member to see these people and the level of access they have in today's administration, um, it's it's very very very. Can I say two things just to, to respond? <clears throat> One is uh, you know when I when I. First, with the involved in groups after 9-11, you'd often hear people say, I think the Islams really want to take over this country. So basically, someone who's reading some stuff on the internet but doesn't even understand the difference between the term Islam and Muslim. Mm -hmm. Now you'll hear people say, Ibu Patel is pursuing his Dawah-based uh, mission to have Sharia law established. It's a very kind of Islamophobically literate. <laughs> no, because, because since 9-11, there has been what Nathan Lean has famously called in the book of the same title, the Islamophobia industry. Which then leads me to my second point, which is philanthropy funds Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting datum for all of us. And I'm wondering if at, at some point, this space couldn't even be a space for convening foundations who are on different sides of issues uh, 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 that have to do with, with divisiveness in our society, and whether or not there's any space for conversations between foundations that have an interest in combating things like Islamophobia, and not that other foundations would see themselves as supporting Islamophobia, they frame it in another way, but it seems like that might be a conversation <coughs> It would be perhaps difficult to convene, but if we were able to manage it, perhaps one that would have uh, a felicitous impact. I'd buy tickets. To that first point, mm -hmm. which is, I always tell the story because it was, it was such a, a sort of pivotal moment in the way that I thought about this. Like, I think this was five or six years ago, uh, I was at the McCormick Foundation and we funded, uh, journalism was one of our big areas that we funded. And we held, the journalism team, which I was not a part of, uh, held a gathering of journalists to talk about ways to sort of be more culturally sensitive to uh, Muslims and the way that they were reporting on Muslims. And so this community was in Nashville, and uh, they told me to go because I was like the one Muslim on staff. And, this. Like, I'll go. Um, and I went, but they had this town hall meeting. This was right around the time of the Murfreesboro mosque controversy, where people didn't want this mosque and built this, long story short, there was this mosque. They were trying to build, and the, the community that was the, came out was like, we don't want this here, it's a terrorist training camp, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what was fascinating, though, know, they held this town hall meeting uh, that was open to the public, and uh, it was hosted by the ACLU and, the, and, and, the, and Vanderbilt and some of others. And uh, this gentleman came, and uh, he, you know, and uh, after, during the Q&A, he was, he was someone that um, I didn't want to stereotype, but certainly didn't seem friendly to Muslims, um, and he wasn't. Uh, and and he, asked, he stood up and he asked a question, and, and he asked one of the panelists, he said, uh, how do you justify the concept of the Gia in Islam? Now, now, I grew up with a mom that's, that was a God-fearing mom who was pretty religious. I had never heard of this word in my entire life. Right? I was like, was that? And and I remember calling my mom that night. Thinking, what is Ikea? Like, is that something that I should know? And she just started laughing. And, and I'm not the sort of religious scholar, but the, the basic understanding from what I understood is that this idea of of, of, of being sort of preserved your life if, if someone is you know has a gun to your head. I'm using a, a stupid example, and you have to take bacon or something. 
do it, right? Just preserve your life. But the way that they've sort of reframed the conversation is that we are allowed to, we are taught and encouraged to lie. And so, and it's so insidious because there's no way, because if you say, like, that's not true, they're like, oh, that's what your fake sounds like. <laughs> it's actually incredibly insidious the way that that sort of concept has been perverted. Um, but to your point, what was the most fascinating thing is that, it, like, I had never even heard of this word. I, this was not sort of, and I was like, these guys are more religiously literate than <laughs> I am, you know? And, and so it was, it was, it was a, a, a huge sort of turning point for me uh, around the way that I understood it. So. Mary, uh, do you want to introduce what? Oh, sorry. What, I'm, I'm oh, yeah. Really yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, would, I would like to just uh, answer your question as well and, and everything everybody said, but in my mind, the difference between post 9-11 Islamophobia and now is that that was reactive. A trauma took place and everybody tried to do their best to address it. Now it is with political purpose, it's systemic. And um, so it's deliberately um, creating that, that divide or going deeper with it for political purpose. Which we see across the board. Yes. On lots of issues. Sure. Yeah. So that's, in my mind, the difference. Reactive and this with a political purpose. Very selfish political purpose. Do you mind if I add a little more? I'll just add one more thing, which is like, it's like you, we, like we thought we got past something. So again, I think most of my remarks today have to do with me as a community member and not, uh, you know, not professionally. But I'll just say, I think there's a, sense of exhaustion, <laughs> emotional exhaustion, and just like feeling beleaguered and feeling like it's like five steps back uh, and even further back um, repeatedly. And so you're almost just like, oh, when's this gonna end? So so there's that aspect of it too on the community side, a collective feeling of um, helplessness and just moving backwards. Um, also, there was such amazing progress made over the last decade. I mean, like, there's a whole army of amazing uh, American Muslim lawyers who went to law school inspired by thinking, you know, thinking about themselves in, in a really newly civically engaged way. It's empirically demonstrable. But, like, you know, there's also things that happen, like, like then you go to law school and you realize how hard it is to be a public interest lawyer, and then you end up in a corporate job, and then now we have all these, like, <laughs> So, so there's just been so much stuff happening in the community uh, in the last decade, and so I think people are tired. I think from the systemic, just really big perspective too, is that America's been in a pressure cooker for the past since 9/11, um, and so if you look at the economics of um, how much hate has grown in the past 10 years for the Muslim community. And all of a sudden, in the past few years, you just see everything exploding and everyone having extreme reactions, and it's spread like wild, wildfire, I would say. Um, it's a lot of uh, just sheer ignorance. Um, there's a lot of separation as well between the communities when they're so, they're not engaging with each other, they make judgments about each other um, instead of seeing what their commonalities are. But I think because we got to a moment where everything was falling apart, the racial tension, the fact that racial tension is being talked about the way that it is being talked about at this point, um, and talking about racial bias, et cetera, that all of those things did, weren't there before. They were in the conversation. They were happening on the grassroots level, but not on this like national public um, platform. Um, and part, it's because of the politics, um, political situation as well, but just, sort of generally, the state of our American society is not great. The only thing I'd add to this is I think the current, what I see as a big difference is, I think Islamophilia is just as much of a problem as Islamophobia, right? Mm -hmm. So even those that currently, it happens to be on the left, that want to champion Muslim rights or Muslim, uh, they want, but we, we, to be an American Muslim that fits that, they have created a box as well. And so in, in the past, on the left, there were opposed, people that were opposing Islamophobia came to it through empathy, which was interesting and had its own challenges. But now the people that are fighting against Islamophobia outside of the Muslim community also come to it through a political purpose. And that political purpose doesn't help the Muslim community. 
because both in order for us to satisfy the right or the left, we have to be someone that they want us to be rather than who we are. And I think that is something that I have never witnessed until this last year. And so it's an interest. So I think that's that's a big change and a big challenge for us as a community, uh, both individually as well as professionally as well as within our philanthropic activities. It would be uh, it would be folly for me to try to summarize this extraordinary discussion over the past two hours. So I'm not going to try to. Um, I'm going to merely thank our five panelists and all the terrific questions and other guests we've had here today for a terrific discussion. And turn it back to Sharik and again thank all of you, especially our panelists and others who've come from long distances to participate in our workshop series today. And I'll turn it back over to Sharik. I just wanted to echo your thanks to this amazing panel. I think uh, when you dream of something in your mind of what you want to do as an academic, sometimes it doesn't work out. And so and this this worked out really well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to thank Mark. Uh, Mark's been visiting uh, Mont Chair for the past two years. And I, in many ways, Mark came to me a, a couple of years ago and said, I'm thinking about doing this, and I want to work, help your cause in talking about Muslim community philanthropy. And you know, it takes leadership and vision to do that. And I really appreciate uh, uh, the, uh, Mark's leadership in this role to make these two convenings happen. I want to also thank my friend, uh, David King, who at Lake Institute of Faith and Giving has really created a space within the school for the work that we're doing. Uh, the only other thing, and I'm similarly not going to summarize because I think your words uh, in their original form are the most eloquent. I do want to recognize a few people in the room, just not from the purposes of recognition, but so that you all know some of the people that have flown in just to be part of this conversation. Um, and so Muhi Khwaja is here from uh, California, is trying to create an American Muslim Community Foundation. Uh, Mira Nigaz is here with, is the Executive Director of the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding. They do the American Muslim Poll. They've done some research on civic engagement and philanthropy and really important research for those of you that are studying, go check out their website. But thank you, Mira is here from DC. They have, uh, 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 they have, uh, Eunice, sorry, uh, uh, is from, uh, uh, is out of Dallas, is a social entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I do have that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm English and I bring with it the authority to give titles. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> and then uh, we have Rashid Ahmed, who's the executive director of the Islamic Medical Association of North America. It's one of the long, it's one of the oldest. Muslim immigrant professional organizations uh, in this country, and he's here from Chicago. And of course, we have Cengiz, who does all the web and so on, and he will be taking testimonials and photographs uh, for those of you that are willing to give a couple of minutes of the outside. Yeah, just outside so, the whole couple of minutes won't take long. So he has a couple of questions he'll ask you, uh, and uh, I, uh, we'd appreciate if you could uh, give him his uh, testimonials. But thank you very much for those who are on the panel, as well as those that are in the audience. Please for the students and others who are here, please come up and meet our panelists or any of the other guests.